Well, with the first ever match at Q2 Stadium in the books, uh, I'm excited about talking to the three folks we have with us as uh, all three on hand have already experienced Q2 Stadium live and in person. Just looking around me, Lee Nichols, the executive director at the North Austin Soccer Alliance. Jeremiah Bentley, of course, host of the very popular Moon Tower Soccer Podcast, or at least one of the top two most popular hosts of that podcast. Uh, Jeremiah also sits on a variety of uh, boards and Chamber of Commerce in Austin. And we've got I Imani Williams uh, as well, who is a, well, she pulls double duty, both a capo for the American Outlaws, a supporters group for uh, U.S. national teams, as well as, of course, right here with Los Verdes cheering on Austin FC. And uh, let me just jump right in and let you kind of uh, briefly sum up uh, all of your relationship with soccer. Lee, I know uh, your experience with Austin soccer goes back to the Aztecs. Uh, how, how did you get sold on soccer, and, and, and where were you in life? Well, actually, it goes back a little further than that. I started coaching my daughter with North Austin Soccer Alliance uh, back in 2005, and I knew nothing about the sport at the time, uh, so she got some really bad coaching. <laughs> but uh, uh, eventually, I kept coaching with them and then uh, uh, got my way on to the board of directors, and now I'm the executive director, our only paid employee, uh, and then I started following professional soccer in about 2011. Uh, Clint Dempsey, I saw I was playing in the English Premier League and being a Texan from a small town, I was like, hey, I'm going to follow this guy wherever he's playing. So then I became a Tottenham fan. And then around that same time, uh, Aztecs 2.0 started up. So that was my first taste of live in-person professional soccer. Yeah, Aztecs 2.0, of course, uh, first in the PDL or what was the PDL now? Uh, League Two of the USL, and more recently, I uh, went to that third division of USL as well with some familiar names. Uh, Jeremiah, I, I, obviously, uh, with, with your podcast, you, you've had a chance to follow Austin FC closely. Uh, at what point uh, did soccer take hold of uh, so many of the uh, waking hours of your day? Yeah, so I think I have like the common story for so many people that grew up in Texas. Like I played when I was a kid for three or four years just as a way to, I don't know, my parents to like wear me out and you know for, keep me active and then uh, actually so I've been a big sports fan all my life and watched like world cup matches and stuff like that but really got into it when my first son was born um about 12 years ago because babies don't sleep uh and it's six o'clock in the morning on weekends there's premier league action on tv and so fell in love with liverpool and with the way that it was steven gerrard and fernando torres and the way they played then and you know it really just like really engaged with the sport since since 2009 and then, you know, happened to find out in 2017, there was a potential that we would get a, get a team here and just jumped in because it's a combination of a game I love and a city I love um, and a community I've grown to love. And there's no, no better combination than that. Yeah. Now, now that you mentioned, I, re I remember you telling Mayor Adler on his podcast about uh, those early hours, just desperately searching for something on TV. And then I Imani, I did a little search online. I think I found your uh, your youth uh, highlight reel from playing, but ha how have you evolved from a player into uh, one, one of the uh, top cheerleaders on the sideline who actually never watches many minutes of soccer because you're actually there helping keep all the fans organized? Yeah, it's a, one of the sacrifices you make, including me losing my voice a bit, is um, – <laughs> is uh yeah you don't always get to watch the game usually i have to watch it on repeat like on uh go replay it back if i want to see the game but um yeah so i played when i was really young like um you know watching 99ers was really inspired by that and then um you know i didn't really get too too much into the game after i didn't play as much i mean uh where i was living we had like more of a pay-to-play system everyone i knew who was serious about soccer was playing premier at a young age travel soccer it wasn't something i wanted to make my mom do she was a single mom at the time and I wasn't good enough and I didn't love it enough to like get a scholarship or anything like that. So I kind of had to bin soccer on the playing side. And then um, I ended up uh, watching a lot of soccer. Uh, I was really interested in the 2002 World Cup. I think like I've never really saw a soccer as a sport that people would get excited by just watching. And um, <laughs> I was really curious. I would stay up really, really late 
uh, to watch that 2002 World Cup. And I was, I'd be like, why are these people so excited? Like everyone's having a great time. Of course, I'm 12, and I didn't really know what alcohol was. So, like, uh, <laughs> that's good. There's one of the, yeah, that's one of the factors too. Oh yeah, I grew up in a very like uh, like religious, no alcohol around children type of house. So I had like literally, I don't know if I saw my first beer until I was like 15. Um, but like, uh, yeah, so I watched a lot of soccer. My mom didn't want to pay for cable, so when I was a little bit older, she would drop me off at like Irish pubs. I was like 17 or 18 she would drop me off at the side pub and I would go watch games uh and they kind of like took me under their wing a little bit and so I grew up watching you know Liverpool in Irish pubs with, at like six in the morning like Jeremiah's with his baby um I was with like a bunch of guys with beer bellies um <laughs> like not much has changed on that end guys you know uh but yeah I was just with a bunch of guys out there watching games and fell in love with it and yeah so joined American Outlaws in 2010 uh built up to the 2010 World Cup Became a capo and on the in-stadium committee in 2014. Uh, I've been on the in-stadium committee ever since. Uh, I contributed to the Anfield Rap podcast in the UK for Liverpool. And uh, yeah, now I'm part of Los Burgas, Los Verdes and La Murga. Sorry. Well, you mentioned you've been with the American Outlaws. Is it easy when you yourself move from one city to another to still kind of maintain your status? Yeah, it's crazy. Like, um, I love AO and I've moved all over the place just supporting the team all over the country. So when I was moving to Texas, it was really exciting for me because I knew so many people from Texas already. And uh, even in the Liverpool community, like I was living in Texas in 2019 uh, for a while. And uh, I was uh, abroad in the Netherlands during COVID. I was like stuck overseas. It was like crazy. Um, so when I moved back here, uh, I was really excited to reconnect with my Liverpool family, Jeremiah included. And uh, yeah, my AO family and now the Los Verdes and La Merga people that I see every week and genuinely absolutely adore. We've got amazing soccer community here. I moved here for soccer. Like I feel like I moved here and made this home for soccer. And it's not because we got a new team and there's shiny lights and stuff because other places have gotten new teams before I specifically moved here for soccer for the people involved so if you love soccer and and you either coach or you love watching the game you love playing um this whole environment around Austin FC is fantastic and we'll talk more about that awesome yeah and obviously your mom I'm sure loves the uh, Austin FC TV deals since you don't need cable you can just plug in a good old-fashioned rabbit ears on the TV set. Well, the reason why I wanted to check in with you three in particular, I think you all had uh, different experiences probably going to Q2 Stadium. Obviously, we know uh, Imani, the cameras love her because she's there with the loudest uh, wall of supporters, both uh, Los Verdes, Austin Anthem, collectively the music group of La Merga. Uh, but Jeremiah and Lee, I thought maybe you two might risk every now and then leaving your chairs during the, during the match, uh, or at least at halftime to experience some of the stadium. I, I do assume you all were like me while the stadium was built, even before it was built, you kind of were up to date every time a new news article or tweet would go out about a new feature about it. Uh, Lee, for you, what makes for a good game day experience uh, just from your vantage point at a soccer match? Well, I love being in the supporter section. I was about 20 rows up uh, directly in front of Imani and uh, I just, the intensity of it you know I mean I could sit anywhere in that stadium and have a good time but to be in that section where you're expected to stand and jump and yell and sing for 90 minutes straight is a, an incredibly intense experience uh, and it's it's you know I had fun in the supporter section at the Aztecs games but it's not the same it's it's, it's a very the, the contrast between then and now is huge yeah, I, I, like you, probably very fondly think of the Aztecs experience because especially when you're at House Park, you did have the opportunity to do some marching from the tavern nearby. It certainly had its place. Uh, I was very impressed and will always think very highly of uh, Everly's Armley and all the fans who came out to support each of the generations of those Aztecs and really made them their team since they were the ones who were representing Austin at the time. Uh, Jeremiah, for you, uh, I know college football games and other large packed, you've probably been to stadiums, well over 100,000 screaming fans. But if you're like me, I don't think uh, you knew the difference between 20,000 and 100,000 back on Saturday in terms of everybody being full voice. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the 20,000 was even more, even more intense because uh, one of the, I'll borrow this thing that Landon says a lot and that typically, you know, your American sports culture is something you, you go to 
you get in the stadium and you consume. And so much of the soccer experience has been a creation of it. And especially, you know, getting on the ground floor with these guys and being involved for three years before we even had a team, you know, the ability to help, help create that and be a part of it and kind of understand what's going on. It's been like really intense, man. You know, I love UT, I love UT football and had season tickets. My parents still have season tickets and go to a lot of games. I mean, it's a good, it's a good experience. The tailgating experience is really great, but you know, soccer's just, it's such more of a, the fans are more of a, like a participatory part of the environment, I think, yeah. particularly in the, in the supporters end. I think at one point on air, I even just said, there's just too much to take in. I mean, obviously you have the match that you're trying to follow, but just looking around at everything, the way everybody experiences soccer in a different way. And obviously the way uh, the supporters group with Lee and Imani and, and everybody were in, in and of their own right, just uh, headliners, uh, reason to go out to a stadium and, and take it all in. Uh, before the match, let me go around and ask each of you, what were you all able to do? I'm going to end with Imani because I have to imagine her match day experience does not start on the match day. So Lee, for you, when you got to the stadium or maybe what time uh, did you maybe begin tailgating at a nearby brewery? How did you progress over to Q2 stadium? Well, I took a little walk around on the stadium uh, before the women's game, but uh, for, uh, uh, for Saturday's game, uh, Austin Spurs had a brewery crawl and went from Cellus to Fourth Tap to Hollywood to Circle. Uh, so that was lots of fun. Uh, I didn't participate in the march over because they, uh, Imani, y'all headed over like really early and I, I wasn't done drinking my beer yet. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, just coming into the stadium, just you could feel the electricity. Uh, it was, it was just. It, I was looking around. I've been to pro sports events in other cities, and I was just like, wow, I can't believe this is happening here in Austin. Uh, it's it's almost a frustrating decision to make which brewery nearby you're going to start your day off. Uh, <laughs> luckily, there's more than one home game this year, and everybody can kind of dabble around that and then uh, take in all the different ways to uh, enter the stadium and enjoy the match. Jeremiah, for you, uh, first of all, uh, where – you're not in the sports section, is my understanding. You actually got some season tickets elsewhere. Is that right? I'm next door. We're in 106, which okay. is the next section over. That's because I have a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old yeah. who was not committed enough to come to the first game. I'm like, guys, if you're going to the first game, it's all day. There's no complaining. <laughs> it's going to be an event. And my 12-year-old is like, I'm in, Daddy. Let's do this. And my 9-year-old is maybe. And I was like, maybe is no in this situation. Like, you come – later games you come in september or whatever but like we're, we're all in going in going into this one so we uh we got hopped on the train in lake line uh took it took it down to the kramer station it was like a five minute walk to hop squad hung out at hop squad for a while followed the giant stream of people into the march to the match and got to meet the bus and then um so we probably got in about 6 30 about an hour and a half before into the stadium and did the big walk around um and it was really cool because it was we couldn't walk five feet without like seeing a friend, either somebody we knew through soccer or somebody we knew through the community. And this is like really the first big um, event, like since COVID, it's certainly the first time I've been around 20,000 people since then. And maybe the first time I've been around a hundred people since then. And it was driving my son nuts because he was wanting to get to the queso stand. And he's like, we can't walk five feet without you stopping and talking. It took us like an hour to get over there. And we finally made it and he got his queso and it was amazing. And we got back to the seats um, in time for the festivities, but it was, the, the pregame was a great experience. Uh, when I looked out uh, after setting up the equipment, looking out, folks surprised me how early they were getting to the stadium. Usually tailgating means you're going to have a late arriving crowd, but I think there was a lot of curiosity and, and they, people recognized that was their chance to look around before they were actually in their seats in time for the anthem and in time for introductions. There were not many green uh, empty seats at the, at the time. Okay. So Imani, uh, Challenge by choice. Answer this question however you want. How did your game day experience get started? Oh, I think I spent like 30 hours at the stadium, like in the, in the week building up to the game between the women's game and the Austin FC game and the two TIFOs. I, I had two TIFOs to figure out, not just one. I had two. Um, it was absolutely crazy. So I guess ours kind of started the night before. 
uh, testing the TFO because we had to test it under absolute secrecy, running around making sure people signed their NDAs and all that kind of stuff. Was we didn't want any leaks. It was serious business, y'all. We had insurance waivers. We had NDAs. Then the next morning, we had like something for KVU. So we're out there at like 9 a.m. I think we got there with the rest of the capos to do a little something, something. So then I ended up leaving. I ended up coming back at 12 because we had to start hanging all the banners. So all the banners and flags that you saw in the section, we kind of brought those in around noon, making sure that we were set up, making sure that everything was safe and making sure we were good with the stadium staff. We knew the routine. We rigged the TIFO because we had to bring the TIFO out, rig it to the netting, get ready for the match. Uh, then I, I went home for about a minute because I was like exhausted already. <laughs> I knew I had to gear up for the match. And then I ended up going back. I think I came back around like three or four to hop squad. And then, then I'm in uh, March mode because I was also one of the people meeting with APD uh, talking about what streets are going to close, how they're going to close the street, what our responsibilities were. Our we were just tasked as a supporters group with kind of keeping people in the designated zones. We had like APD at certain points at the beginning in, at the train uh, at the train and like that's pretty much it they're kind of leaving it to us to kind of see how we did with marshalling our own people so yeah if you guys saw me i was like on my bike <laughs> literally stopping in front of people just being like go left go right go right go right like marshalling people then like going ahead of my bike and then like like telling people to curve uh trying to get people to like move out of the way they had an ambulance coming so trying to get this like mass of people something i've gotten good at like life skills that soccer gives you other than soccer is like i'm really good with large crowds of people now and like I'm not afraid to be the one person standing up in front of 10,000, 20,000 people and telling them to move one direction. Uh, then, we, you know, of course, green the bus, lots of energy. I love that. I love that atmosphere outside the stadium. We can get everybody excited. We can teach people the songs. People have never heard a song before outside the stadium. Pre-match is like a great opportunity to get into it and just to, like see how the Murga is and see how we interact with everybody and like see what the, you know, the musical cues are and what, what we're doing and the confetti and the bus and watching the players go by and the look of their on their faces when we when we went by and they had the streamers and we couldn't have smoke uh we weren't allowed to have smoke we really wanted to have smoke so bad or they, they wouldn't let us but we had like tons of confetti and watching the players faces like wow because they were not expecting that that was awesome and then of course boom march is done now i'm like getting ready for capo mode and the tifo so i'm thinking about the tifo now now I've, I've thought about the march and the banners and now it's time for tifo um and i i like to sit, consider myself like a game day match day ops specialist so i love match day ops i don't mind being really really busy on match day i i want to create these amazing experiences so i don't mind like running around doing all this crazy stuff when everybody else just wants to like relax chill and watch the game i, I love gearing up for the match then so yeah so yeah into the stadium uh, I think we, I went around 6.30 or 7. Uh, then it was just about getting the people ready. So we had about, I want to say 30 to 40 people who helped raise the TIFO. So I had to make sure that they were in position in the supporter section uh, because the rig goes back in the supporter section, make sure they're in position, make sure people know what's happening, prepping the crowd because the Austin FC crest went up over the crowd. So prepping the people under the crest so that they know what to expect, meaning like, hey, this TIFO is going to go right up over your head. Don't pop it. Just let it go over your head. Okay. And if you're on the end, hold the end of the TIFO, making sure that they all know what to do at that time, making sure everybody knew their cues, making sure that there's enough people on the ropes because some of those ropes like i think like you, you'd have to be lifting like 300 pounds because just some of the pressure loads are just so different uh making sure nothing um was tangled or anything plus they were installing the smoke on the supporter section like at that moment like like right before the game so like uh in the capo stand the guy's like wiring up all this smoke and he's like don't lean back you could get a pretty bad burn i was like okay fella like <laughs> okay so yeah so yeah tifo boom tifo goes up super excited uh making sure the capos know what's up and then just communicating back and forth in the capo stand trying to stay in rhythm uh that it was really really loud in there i'm so lucky i had that experience i was on the right hand side so like i don't think we were really off on the right uh very much because like i kind of have that experience of like if you miss the start of the song or, or not sure like where they're started you can kind of catch on in the middle or at the end of the verse and kind of get your whole section going from there. Uh, I sometimes, if anyone is in my section, I, I think we're going to rotate, but I personally, I like being in 104. I love that section. Uh, so if you, if you're ever in front of me and, and you see me on the capo stand, you can, one thing you can expect from me is definitely hand signals. I will be signaling out the verses to certain songs so people can follow along because you cannot hear after row like 10 or 15. 
you just can't hear anything on the megaphone anymore. So I just kind of have my hands up, you know, we're doing Macala, we're doing all that kind of stuff. And then you'll see all the hand signals and it worked really, really great. Uh, we had the crowd really moving and I'm so excited. Everybody, La Murga, Los Verdes, Anthem, everybody who, who took part in this, making this all happen, the folks over at the Cin La Cinco do Dose, Oak Army, like we worked so, so hard on this. And yeah, I think I had 40, 50 hour soccer weeks in the two weeks leading up between the two organizations and um it was spectacular this will live in my heart for a long time yeah if you had just been doing the women's national team match against nigeria or if you had just been doing the stadium opener obviously each of those an undertaking in their own right i apologize for the baseball metaphor but uh, you and everybody else hit a home run on, on both of those both of the tifo but also the execution especially for austin fc where you mentioned it wasn't just the initial a TIFO going up, you did have the crest, and then you also had the video board coordinated with it all together. Uh, it was just phenomenal. Uh, it, it was quite, quite the spectacle. Let me uh, go around. I mentioned everybody here, probably every time there's anything to read about Q2 Stadium, made sure that they were aware of it. Lee, did anything surprise you on Wednesday when you showed up to the women's national team about the stadium that, that you were not aware of before showing up? Um. No, I think I'd read up on it a lot. I was a little surprised that I had a seat to sit in in the uh, the South Stand because, uh, and, and then, of course, then Wednesday, uh, I said, oh, I guess we have seats to sit in, and I tried to fold my seat down, and on at Austin FC games, they're locked. So uh, I guess they have different rules for different matches, but that was that was my only real surprise. Uh, uh, I just, uh, no, no surprises. It was exactly what I was hoping for and expecting. Uh, I believe Jeremiah is the all-time leader in tours of Q2 Stadium. Jeremiah, uh, any, anything that when you showed up uh, finally for a match that, that surprised you pleasantly? I just think overall the execution of it from like the first time we saw the drawings, you know, when they were like pitching things to city council, it looked like it was going to be like a big high school football stadium. But to see it, you know, when it was completed and all the murals were up and the restaurant stuff was painted on the south end stuff, I mean, it was really – it was better than advertised. You don't always get that with a building, right? Usually, like, you see the drawing, which is, like, the idealized version of what it's going to be, and then the actual thing's a little disappointing. But, I mean, the building's amazing. The concourses are great. You know, I loved everything about it. I didn't know if I would love, like, the mixed, uh, like, uh, Minecraft creeper style, like, different shades of green seats, but they work, too, you know? They're, they're, they're incredible, you know? So I just I was everything I hoped it would be and more. Yeah, I'm a fan of those seats. The moment I saw them installed, uh, I suggested maybe they can make secret announcements using the magic eye, where if you cross your eyes and look into the seats, you, you could see who the next <laughs> signing was. But now, frankly, they could have bought any color seats they wanted because you were not going to see an empty seat uh, in, in either that women's national team match nor, nor the Austin FC opener last uh, weekend against San Jose. Uh, Imani, from your standpoint, you've been to some of the better soccer-specific venues for what you need to do and for what the supporters want to be able to do, uh, what makes for a good environment and uh, how did Q2 play out? Yeah, the supporter section is fantastic. Those uh, capo stands, we had a couple like practice sessions, like the Murgo practice sessions where we invited like 500 people. And in some way I had like a few hundred. Um, and the first thing I saw, like my eyes are just like, oh, like I can't talk, sorry. But I was just glowing because I saw those capo stands. And, you know, I'm like a little kid. I'm going to go climb on it. I'm going to go stomp on it. I'm going to go shake it. I'm going to be like, how, how sturdy is this? Because we're going to be jumping up and down on these, going crazy. There's going to be two or three of us up there. So I want to make sure they're sturdy and they have a great view of the supporter section. So like the whole section can kind of see you. That was great. Uh, the smoke being installed right behind me, I didn't think it was going to be like directly, directly behind me. That was interesting too. But yeah, there's like not a bad seat in the house. That's what, what I love. Like if you're in the first, if you get there early, you want to be in the first few rows. You can be in the first few rows and you can literally smell the grass. You could see that you practically get sprayed with sweat. Okay. When somebody makes a header. All right. Like it's, you're so close to the pitch and that's what makes it so intimidating. I love the acoustics. I love how it's just an uncomfortable experience for the away team. Or if you go in our locker room, it's immaculate. The lights and it's gorgeous and beautiful. And you feel like you're in a professional sports environment. You go in the away locker room. It's like they put you in a closet, you know, and so get ready for this game in the closet here. Uh, same thing in terms of like, 
you know, the supporter section being loud. Uh, when we have away fans, I don't even know if there are away fans that night, but if we have away fans, they're going to be stuck in the top corner. It's just going to be like a very uncomfortable experience for away fans. We have a true home field advantage. I love that kind of gamesmanship. That's some Real Madrid stuff right there. So like, they're like, play, they're like, no, we're going to put you up in the nosebleeds. So like, if you're going to make a difference to your team, we're going to have to be loud and crazy. But uh, I love Q2. I love what they've done. The stadium staff, Big shout out to Q2 stadium staff. They're absolutely lovely. Alfredo, who works with the supporter section, uh, James with as well. They're so amazing. Um, and everyone from security to the vendors, they're all on top of their game. And it was a pleasure to be there with them the last couple of nights. Yeah, I will say this. Even if away supporters are in the worst seats in the entire venue, they're still pretty good seats. Uh, I try to walk around. I couldn't find a bad vantage point everywhere you're sitting. You feel like you're right on top of the pitch. Uh, it's hard, hard to miss anything. Any of you all hear from friends about, about their more casual experience going uh, and, and taking it in how, how their vantage point was Lee or Jeremiah. Yeah, I've got one. So like our company has tickets that are like field seats. They're like section seven or whatever. So a group of our executives went who are like not soccer fans, but like whining and dining um, and they, but they came, they came out of it like blown away because like they weren't fans. They've just seen the sport on TV and sort of just casually and said like, it's a beautiful live game. And it like TV doesn't do it well. And they were especially impressed with Brad Stuver. So I was like, look, you guys don't know soccer, but you, you, you pick up the most important thing. Brad Stuver is amazing. Um, and so, yeah, I think they, they were blown away by it too. And had, had no expectations going in. Like I had to convince them that it was going to be worth it to, to get these seats. And they were I'll never get a chance to sit there now. They were so over the moon excited about, <laughs> about the time they had. The worst kept secret. Lee, did you hear from anybody? I don't really have any anecdotes from game day, but uh, my parents were visiting and I said, hey, let's drive up Barnett Road. I want to show you this new pro sports stadium we have. And I wasn't sure if they'd be impressed by it or not. And we passed by on Barnett and they both looked at it and just said, holy moly, that is a great stadium. So even from all the way from over on Barney Road, they were impressed. Uh, I took my dad over uh, the Friday before just so he could get his first look at the stadium. Uh, he, he went to grad school at Texas. I've lived my whole life here. My mom went to Texas, and, but uh, it was his first time to see the stadium and have really a professional team other than just his college team in town. And there happened to be some player from Chelsea also in the Verde store at the time, but uh, <laughs> I did not bother explaining who that was until we left and, and got out of there. But uh, he was really bowled over by the environment. Look forward to getting him out to a match. Let anybody uh, eat anything that they'd like to recommend uh, while at the stadium. The water is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine Thanks, that. Yeti. Uh, the water is delicious. I wish I got to eat. Uh, you guys, please tell me you had some queso. You get on that queso mission success mission yeah. successful, Jeremiah. Yeah, we did. The scraps that were left after my son like went to town on the queso fountain queso with the uh, these are the pork uh, was it, it looked amazing. He, he really enjoyed it. Um, and I think like one of those recipes came from somebody's kitchen, right? Like H-E-B had a contest and the, like the winning recipe was 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 one of the ones they served, which I thought was really cool, too. So, yeah, I would highly recommend um, the Verde queso from the queso fountain. I was impressed by the craft beer selection at the uh, little store right underneath the supporter section. Uh, you know, pro sports events, you don't expect a big selection of craft beer. You expect the usual suspects to be available. And uh, they've got lots of good local beers uh, ready for you to enjoy. I would think, and I could be completely wrong, a pro tip to anybody who's standing in a long line at the stadium, go to the concessions by the supporters section, even though there's tons of people there, not many of them actually will be getting out of their seats uh, once that match is underway. Uh, I could be completely wrong if I am speak up, but uh, otherwise let, let me. I, I can give another pro tip uh, that, that I picked up on game day was uh, if you know, you're going to have two beers during the game, buy both beers before the game ever starts. Cause at halftime, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of time. The U S women's game. I went for a halftime beer and then I missed the first eight minutes of the second half. And I corrected that problem with the Austin FC game. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, Lee, Imani, did you learn anything from your Wednesday experience that helped make your Saturday experience uh, even better? 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, again, shout out to Q2 Stadium and the whole staff because uh, the Capos now have water. The Capos and the Murga to have water next to us uh, because we're like doing a lot of work. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're vocalizing, we're emoting and the musicians are playing and we don't have time to like put down our, our, our instruments or, 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 and go meet each other. We have to meet and kind of have a half time talk about what's going right. Do we need to fix anything? Do we need to change anything? Do we need to move anything or anyone? Um, so they put water down there for us, which is amazing, especially for our drummers, our bombo players on those big, big drums. They put so much work in like one of our bombo players, Jeshua, I think he had like blisters all over his hands after the game. The drum line does so much work. It's asking a lot of them to like put the drums down and go wait online to go to the bathroom or wait online to get water. Uh, so very happy about Q2 doing that. Um, yeah, I would definitely say you can bring a open 20 ounce, or what's got to be closed when you get there, but they'll open it at security, a 20 ounce bottle container of water. So you can bring a, a 20 ounce bottle of water and that's great because you can refill it in the stadium. So if you want to drink it really quick before the game, because you know, if you're going to be sitting in the support section, it's going to be loud and it's going to get crazy. You're going to be hot. Like drink it really quick before the game, go to one of the many fountains and the Yeti, the Yeti station. There's a couple water fountains as well. Remember Q2 is new. Those are new water fountain filters, okay? So, like, you don't have to worry about the quality of the water fountain. Water is great. Uh, so you go over there, get your water, get ready. And, yeah, what, what Lee said about double fisting those pints, I think it's definitely worth it for sure. Uh, uh, that's a great note about the water being prepared and knowing what you're able to bring. Obviously, it wouldn't be Austin, Texas, in a stadium in Austin if, if we didn't also try to figure out how to minimize the plastic by al allowing folks to, to bring a, a single bottle and – refill it once they're on the inside so let, let me have final question here for each of you uh it'll be the same question but again we're joined by lee nichols the executive director of the north sock north austin soccer alliance he like the other two members of supporters group cheering on austin but all three with kind of different match day experiences jeremiah bentley of course uh, co-host along with landon cottom who was mentioned earlier of uh, moon tower soccer that comes out most tuesdays i think they record usually on a monday or sunday uh, but each week they get you caught up on a lot of the new talking points and uh, the new quick reactions to what they just saw the weekend prior. And of course, the Imani Williams, who uh, you heard her reference Capo is uh, if you've watched Sopranos, uh, I'm sure it's a lot of the same, but uh, she does that both with the American outlaws of the red, white, and blue, and now of uh, Los Verdes in the supporters group for uh, Austin FC of the Verde in black. So my question for all of you is now that you've had an Austin FC match under your belt, what did you forget to do or realize you didn't experience this past weekend that your next time uh, at the stadium, you're, you're making it a point that you uh, take in before your, your match day gets underway? Lee? Well, uh, I guess I need to – actually, you were talking about the stadium food, and I actually did not experience that. I loaded up on tacos over at Hop Squad. So uh, perhaps this uh, next game I'll leave a little room in my belly to try some of the stadium food. It looked really good but I had four tacos before I ever entered the stadium. <laughs> Jeremiah. So I had a 12 year old who was cranky and tired and did not stick around for true level fighting the end. Uh, it, at the end. And so I, you know, and I, I love that song and I'm glad it's a part of the experience. So he's just going to have to suck it up next game uh, and, and stand for a little while longer and, and experience that too. Hey, elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, True Love will find you in the end. Uh, we have seen some teams where just kind of organically a, a song has become their song, win or lose. Uh, we did see the players for Austin FC gather around the supporters group at the end there. Uh, but how did that come about? Uh, well, True Love will find you in the end. Uh, the Murga, you know, it's always been the Dan Johnson song has always been an iconic song for Austin for a while now, I think since like the 80s. Um, and, you know, we do some work with the Hi, How Are You project with Los Verdes. So it kind of fit because we have like a Hi, How Are You scarf and everything. And we just wanted to remind the team that we're there for them and remind each other that we're here for each other, too. I mean, there are bigger things in the result. Uh, I think the camaraderie that we all feel and the connection we all feel together is super huge. And I don't know, we started, we always knew we wanted to do it. And I think we started doing it at the end of matches, at the end of our sessions together. And we're like, this fits. We'll raise the scarves. We'll greet the team. I think the players love it as well. Like they, them coming over to visit us means a lot because a lot of teams, a lot of players, they don't do that after the match. Um, they did like a little lap and then they came to visit us specifically. And we love that song. We used to start it just, it used to just be kind of a slow song. 
a slow song. And then all of a sudden we were just like, you know what, let's pick this up. So it starts off really, really slow. Like, uh, you know, like, like, you know, like come on you Spurs is like really, really slow. And like, when the Spurs go rushing in for Spurs is like really, really slow. Or, like you'll never walk alone is really slow. And then it's just all of a sudden it just becomes a bounce. So like the last two times going through it, it's just like bounce, get your scarf out, start jumping up and down, just be like, you know, we, we're still here for you no matter the result. Uh, and just the, the players don't get to watch us during the game. Uh, they can hear us. It means they can't hear each other half the time, but they don't get to watch us during the game. So uh, just as somebody who's always looking back at the crowd and I get to experience the game through the crowd's eyes, um, getting that opportunity to see so many people just feel joy is really, really special. And, and no matter the type of game that they had, and, and I know they were really disappointed that they didn't score our first goal against that first win. And that means a lot to supporters that they care that much. They were like absolutely gutted about it. I mean, when I saw Diego, like, you know, uh, lifting up the short on the, on the right leg, I was like, Oh no, it's game time. Cause whenever that short comes up, it, it's on. Uh, but yeah, it was absolutely great. And we're going to do that at the end of every match. And we used to do suggest that people come stay. And if they're in a different part of the stadium, and they want to come check out the supporters section. It usually takes like five minutes after the match ends. And like, if you guys want to come over, I think it'll be fine. Like if you want to come closer, even into like 105 or 106, just to kind of experience the true love. Um, it was absolutely spectacular and, and phenomenal. And I uh, can't wait. Can't wait till Columbus, man, we're going to rock it. It's only, it's pure poetry that we didn't score just so we can score our first goal at Q2 versus Columbus. And you know, it's true. And we can't wait to have it happen. Well, uh, I think it's become very clear quickly how much uh, the players uh, adore the supporters and how much you all have won over their attention and won over their appreciation. And, and you can tell during a match how much it means to them to to try to to be live up to everything that you all have have hoped they would be in this first year of Austin FC. Guys, I appreciate all three of you joining. I know uh, how much you all have put into things. A couple of you were even city council meeting celebrities on the streaming video late at night when you would give your testimony about what pro soccer's return to the city and its first major league soccer franchise would mean to the town. Uh, but there's really no wrong way to experience a match day at Q2 Stadium from what we're finding out, but certainly appreciate the unique perspectives from each of you. Look forward to seeing you around Q2 and around town. Uh, Lee Nichols, Jeremiah Bentley, Imani Williams, thanks for your time.